All right. Um, thanks to everyone being here. Um, to get started, I'll briefly introduce what this organization is all about, and we'll talk about the events, and I'll introduce the speakers. But before going to all that, for just some logistics, this is the first time we are doing a webinar, mostly because we're recording and we want to respect everyone's privacy. But for your comments and questions, please leave them in the Q&A section and we'll monitor them. And we'll encourage people to get on the stage um, in the discussion section. So please feel free to let us know if you want to um, have your video and audio on and just engage with the speakers directly, which we would highly encourage, but we understand if people feel uncomfortable about that. So to start with, the Student Solidarity Organization was founded by a bunch of us, um, NGB students, and is run by students and is student membership to mainly give students a voice for their concerns and increase their decision-making power in our departmental affairs and things that affect our own growth and education. And mostly we just want to create a space for solidarity where we can get together and talk about difficult topics and share and learn from each other. Um, so we're doing a bunch of stuff. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and one of us will share our email in the chat for you all. So moving on to today's event, we're really excited to host our first Growing Up in Science event. And what this means in a nutshell is that we have invited two excellent scientists to share their journeys of how they got to where they are now. Uh, what obstacles they overcame, uh, encountered, and how they overcome them. And mostly just think about this as a behind the scenes sneak peek into how like the true journey looks like when we see people who we admire and we aspire to be like them. Um, you can also read more about them in their official and what we're calling like the unofficial career parts, and we'll also link that in the chat. Um, so our first speaker would be Dr. Kayla Singleton. Um, Dr. Singleton is a developmental neuroscientist, a postdoctoral fellow at Emory University, and adjunct professor at Agnes Scott College. She earned a PhD in neuroscience from Georgetown University and a Bachelor's of Science from ASNE, ASC in neuroscience and classical history and culture. Kayla is currently mentored by Dr. Victor Fondes and investigates mitochondria integrity and localization in Menke's disease, a progressive form of childhood neurodegeneration that is triggered by dysregulation of copper. Her career in the field has been funded for 12 years by NINDS, where she has won spots on competitive T32s, has been funded um, on R25s, and recently securing her own F99KOO funding. She's also a co-founder and president-elect of Black in Euro, which I'm sure all of you all have heard about, uh, an international organization becoming a nonprofit that focuses on celebrating Black scholars in Euro-related fields. And she's very invested in diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and mentoring for underrepresented minorities. Uh, more recently, Kayla and her Black and Euro colleagues published a letter in Nature Review's Neuroscience titled An Open Letter to Past and Future Members, uh, Future Mentors of Black Neuroscientists, with the goal of encouraging and advising future mentors how to most effectively mentor Black students. Um, her fun fact is that um, she has never won. She has never lost the game of categories in her life. Almost screwed that up. <laughs> um, with that, Dr. Singleton, please take it away. And we're excited to hear your behind the scenes story. Yeah, awesome. Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, categories is a really great game and I've learned, this has been my fun back for most of Zoom. And I've learned recently that a lot of people have never played categories or like know what it is. And it's really painful for me because it's pretty much all I did in high school is place categories. Um, we can talk about that a different time. Um, so I prepared a couple of slides um, just to talk about the salient questions um, that were brought up or proposed that I talk about. Um, so I'm going to go through them now. Um, also, before I get started, I just want to encourage everyone to reach out to me. Um, I love talking to students, to trainees, to faculty members. Um, either on Twitter or via email, um, but feel free to talk to me. Um, I'm really friendly from the South, pretty friendly there. Um, so I am Kayla S. Singleton, um, and if you Google me, you will probably find my website and this list of accomplishments and accolades. Um, I've been funded by NINDS for 12 years. I've won a lot of awards, mentored a lot of students, have a lot of fun on social media, talking about science, um, and am in general like pretty successful. Um, but if you were to ask anyone that actually knows me, they would probably tell you that I am 
yes, very successful, but they see me more as a energetic, playful, happy person in their lives. So I identify as a black multiracial queer woman who happens to be a developmental neuroscientist. I feel very strongly that while being a scientist is important to me, it is not an intrinsic part of my identity. I was not born a scientist, I grew into one. Um, and it's part of the reason why I love neurodevelopment so much. I am a Cancer Sun, a Leo Moon, and a Sagittarius Rising. I also really love personality tests in any way, shape, or form. And as we'll talk about uh, in this presentation a little bit, um, Christmas is really big to me, and so is building a chosen family and a group of people that support you. Um, one of the first questions that uh, really stuck out to me was, how did I decide to do what I do now? Um, and so growing up, I only ever had three real like career dreams in my life. Um, my family was always really adamant that I had to go to college, but they didn't really care what I did at college or what I did afterwards, um, which I think sometimes is pretty rare. So when I was little, um, my first career goal was to be a Christmas elf. That was like the thing that I thought was going to set me uh, high above stage, above everyone else. I would go to like riches, uh, which is an old department store that no longer exists, um, but like riches or Macy's and ask about like how they did the ribbon work, how they packaged presents. I was really committed to that. Um, my dream of being a Christmas elf was ruined by a gentleman of the name of Clark Fisher in the second grade, I'll never forget him, um, when he told me that Santa wasn't real. And so that was really difficult for me. And so my next career goal was that I wanted to be a woman with a nice office in the way that women in romantic comedies or like in TV shows, they don't really have careers, but they have really nice offices and they like eat lunch in a really nice office and they have really great decorations. And I was like, I can totally do that, bet. Um, after that, I think I was like, I was like early elementary school, middle school. Um, and then after that, I had the opportunity to work um, in a science class and they, we did an outreach event sponsored by the University of Georgia where I got to dissect a sheep's brain and this was in the seventh grade. Um, and it was a really big moment for me. It was the most fun I had ever had in school. It was something that was really hands-on and engaging for me. And I should note that like, I was never really good at science. I didn't really care about anything as a teenager. Um, I grew up in a really affluent part of Georgia. And if I'm being completely honest, my family's only real goal for me was that I would go to college, get a degree and get married. Um, that's really all they wanted me to do to continue our like family lineage and line. And so this science outreach event was really important in inaugural in my life because it gave me the first chance of learning about the brain or knowing what it was. So I think it was 12 or 13. Um, and in that moment, I decided that I wanted to study the brain that I thought was really cool. Um, and because I never it cared about science, like I always did well in school, but I never cared about anything. Um, everybody in my life was like, sure, Kayla, sure you'll do that. Um, but here we are now. And my current career goal is to do what I'm doing, which is to be a developmental neuroscientist, but also to be an exceptional researcher and mentor and educator to people. And one of the reasons I love neurodevelopment so much um, is because I'm fascinated by this idea of growth and the way that growth changes you as a person and the things that your different experiences can teach you. And this is something that is really foundational to the process of neural development. So I will show this one science slide. And then after that, I promise I won't show another one. But for me, the process of developing a scientist and developing the nervous system or neural development are really similar. Um, so in neural development, this process is stereotyped across species, which you have very early on, are these common progenitor cells that continue to divide in order to populate the surface of the embryo. These progenitor cells will go on to have these shifts in cell fate and they'll become neuronal progenitors and they'll exit the cell cycle and now their new job is to populate the nervous system specifically. Over time, these neuronal progenitors will differentiate into immature neurons. So neurons that are really lacking proper maturation or synaptic connection. They're like trying to figure out where they're going, what they're doing. And then eventually they'll maturate into a sea of diverse neurons that play many, many roles that have unique functions and features and forms. And when we think about the development of a scientist, these processes are really similar, right? When you 
first become interested in science if you're me in seventh grade, um, you have many scientific ideas. You're taking classes that cover a wide range of scientific topics, everything from biology to chemistry. And over time, you'll sort of exit that general science knowledge and increase your neuroscience studies if being a neuroscientist is what you want to do. And eventually you'll become a student or a trainee. You'll be a person that is constantly receiving or gathering feedback and new information. And eventually you'll maturate into a mentor. And this mentor experience is unique, right? Because you'll continue to train other students and help them through their journeys. And both of these processes are regulated by these sort of intrinsic factors. When we talk about them for cells, it's transcription factors or these environmental factors or decisions that cells have to make. And so when we talk about the orchestration of me or the development of me into a scientist, it is my, the intrinsic factors to my identity as a black queer woman coming from a multiracial family, the daughter of a prison warden and an alcoholic, but it's also the extrinsic factors, the environments that I grew up in, the, um, the household that I grew up in and left eventually, but it's also the decisions that I made, the decision to go to an all women's college, to attend an interdisciplinary program for graduate school um, and start black and neuro and apply to different funding types. Um, but it's also the people, right? It's the other people that influence the way that I do my science, the way that I talk about my science and give me support throughout all of that. And so for me, these processes are really connected. And so my drive to be a successful developmental neuroscientist comes from my drive to be a successful and happy person as well. Um, another question that I always get um, that I thought was really interesting was, do I ever consider quitting? And I think that this photo is actually a really good uh, example of that. And so the answer is absolutely, all the time, uh, regularly, actually, I think I could uh, do pottery. I could lay on the floor for hours at a time and contemplate life. Um, I really do think about quitting. And I think in graduate school, I thought, the most about quitting um, science and academia in general. And so the fun story about this picture is that this was taken in 2016 on Georgetown Students Research Day, uh, which is just the day where graduate students present. Before this photo was taken, I was literally um, laying on the floor. Um, I'm a big floor layer. I think it gives me, grounds me. Um, but I was laying on the floor and I was crying because none of my experiments were working and everything was really stressful. And a lot of the data in this poster behind me is um, from like previous graduate students. And I was just the saddest grad student anyone had ever seen. Um, slightly after, right before this photo was taken, I won a uh, best poster talk um, and was deeply surprised. And then now this photo is featured in um, an SFN article that I was a part of for Society for Neuroscience about advice in navigating academia as a black woman. And so when I first submitted this photo, I forgot because I just looked so happy in it. And I was like, this is a good photo of me, I'll put it forward. Um, and then one of my friends was like, were you crying right before we took that? And I said, yes, I was, I was. Um, and so I think considering, thinking about leaving academia or leaving science is normal because it also shows that you're worried about your success and you're worried about how good you will be and how good things will turn out. Um, another example of if I ever considered quitting was actually right after I got um, my F99 K00 grant. Um, and so this grant funds me, it funded the last two years of my grad work and it funds my postdoc for the next four years at Emory. Um, and it's a grant that I earned by myself. Um, and right after I got that grant, one of my uh, mentors on my team told me that I had only gotten it because I was black, that my science wasn't good or innovative, that I needed to focus on being the scientist that everyone thought that I was because I wasn't that. Um, and so that was, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, it was a really hard time for me and I actually didn't tell anybody about it for a really long time. Um, that like conversation, just because it was so draining. Um, and so right after that, I also thought about quitting because I was like, if I'm earning this very prestigious award, but I don't actually deserve it, then what am I doing here? Um, which also I think leads into the next question about imposter syndrome, right? Given that specific situation, I definitely felt like an imposter, but I definitely felt like an imposter way before then. 
Um, and I think one of the reasons that moment was so salient for me was because it felt like I had been like caught, like fun someone was finally like, you have no idea what you're doing. And I said, oh, you're right. I, I do have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but on a different note, I do feel like an imposter regularly, even now, all, all the time, every day, I'm, I'm winging it. I'm making playlists to do science to, I'm like trying to mentor and train and teach students the best way that I know how with the purest intentions possible and trying to grow and learn from it. Um, a couple of ways that I cope with imposter syndrome is through the consumption of art and things that make me happy. I remind myself that while being a scientist is fun, it is also just my job at the end of the day. It is a thing that pays me to do something that I love and I'm invested in, but I also, there are also facets of my personality that have nothing to do with science that are just me experiencing life in joy in a way that I think is really undervalued. Um, another way that I cope with imposter syndrome is through um, finding times for the things that make me happy. Um, one of those clearly is still Christmas and the celebration of gift giving and family coming together. But for me, it's also college football and forcing my college football happiness and television watching onto my friends from graduate school um, and making them do those things with me. Um, I think another big thing and another question that I would really love to hear um, Sally's uh, response to as well is what is the most psychologically taxing thing about this job? Um, because I'm pretty sure we could just spend a whole seminar or webinar on this topic alone. <laughs> but I think for me, when I was in graduate school, one of the most taxing things was the sacrifices, the things that people don't see. So I moved, I lived in Atlanta my whole life. Um, and although I wasn't very close with my family, I had built a community of friends and people that really supported me. And for six years, I lived 700 miles from them. And it was really hard to have to build a new support system and a new network and a new community. Um, I'm also like a single woman without any children. So I didn't have that extra burden, not burden, but extra responsibility of a family, of having to start one, of having to make graduate school work within the confines of my life in that way. So I was just a single woman making friends, trying to figure it out. Um, and I did, right? I, I did make a new sense of family and community in DC. Um, so many friends that helped me get through hard times in science, but also hard times in life that no one really talks about. Um, and for me, it was really exciting and it made it worth it. But then again, when I started my postdoc, I had to move again. I had to travel again and sort of start over. And it's one of the reasons why I actually chose to do my postdoc at Emory um, was because my family was here, because I knew that I didn't want to move to a new city and start all over again and have to build those networks all over again. Um, and I think another big way that I deal with how taxing academia is, is to really remember why I started, right? One of the biggest joys for me in science is watching other people's scientific dreams come true. So watching all of these people in these pictures, my friends defend their theses and become doctors and start these new journey in their life. Um, was so inspiring to me. And every couple of months, it was like a new breath of fresh air. And so one of the things that I always tell my students is to remember why you started doing this, whatever it was that initially drove you into science, into academia. And for me, it's the growth. It's watching people grow um, and figuring out how I can continue growing, how I can continue bettering myself, sometimes in a system that doesn't want to better itself. Um, and I think that that's also really hard. Um, but yeah, so my biggest advice always is to remember how much you've grown. The infographic CV on the left was my CV when I defended my dissertation and this is it over here now on the right. Um, and I never thought that I would do any of the things that I have done, that I would win the awards that I got, that I would have the funding that I have. I always describe my science truly as pipetting clear liquids into clear liquids while dancing. Like that's what I do every day. Um, and my dad still doesn't believe that I have a real person job sometimes. So I also think that that's normal. 
but I have experienced so much growth and so much change in who I am as a person. And I'm really intentional now with my time and my energy because I have to be. And I think that that's also a lesson that we don't talk about a lot. Um, and so with that, um, these are also all of the people that make my science and my life possible and better. They're my friends, my family, um, my labs, obviously my funding, because I do need to get paid sometimes. Um, but I'm happy. I feel like that was just this at the stage uh, for this conversation. And I'm happy to chat more, or answer any questions. Hi, Kayla. Um, I just have a question uh, pertaining to, so you were mentioning that, uh, great talk, by the way. Yeah, I, this really resonated a lot with me and makes me feel better about certain things. Uh, definitely the imposter syndrome part. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, like making time for things that make you happy and, you know, that that's all well and good, but like, how do you actually divide your time? I find myself often having a, a substantial amount of work to do and it's almost impossible some weeks. Uh, how, how have you done it? So I um, will really just like, take over a Google calendar, like no one's business. And so the first thing that I do now during my weeks um, is I will go into my Google calendar and I'll just like pick a cutoff time. It'll be like, like today it's like 8.30, it'll be 8.30. Um, and I just go ahead and put in that time. It's the first thing that I do where I'm like, I'm busy, I'm resting, I'm being horizontal, I'm laying down. And the act of doing that for me, at least it makes it it makes it seem like a thing I can check off of my to-do list, but it also, because I have done it for so long now, is like second nature where I'm like, no, this is actually a task that has to be done. Otherwise I'm not gonna be able to do any of the 50, 11 things I have to do tomorrow. Um, so for me, it's about physically scheduling in that downtime and then getting into the habit of doing it constantly. So you feel less guilty about it over time. And there are definitely days, right, where I'm like, watching MasterChef and also like analyzing data. But the fact that, honestly, the fact that I'm not just analyzing data or like just sitting in lab for 12 hours a day is a really big step for me. And so I'd also encourage people to like, if you don't have to be in lab to do the work, don't be in lab. Like you can go home and work from home. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we can't actually um, accidentally work from home all the time. Um, so those are the, like, using Google Calendar or, like, some sort of calendar app is the biggest thing for me. And I, it, it is really hard. It's taken a long time for me to, like, figure that out, too. Is, did you ever have to have, like, a conversation with, uh, with your PI or your superiors about delving out this work versus life balance? I had to talk to you, my grad school mentor, about it. One of my grad school mentors about it once. Um, and it truly was in a... I was truly in a space where I was so burnt out that nothing, even if I wanted to design an experiment, the experiment wouldn't have made any sense. Um, and so I was like, I need to go home and see my family and do nothing. And I think in my head, that conversation was going to be very scary, but they were really supportive. I will say when I was picking out my postdoc, I was really intentional about that being like the first thing that we talked about, about me saying like, I don't wanna work like 100 hour days for no reason. Um, I would like breaks and rest. And so it was about me also having like the confidence to be like, this is a thing that I need. Like it's a non-negotiable thing because rest isn't earned. You just deserve it because you're a person. And I think sometimes you have to remind your PI of that or like your bosses or people in positions of power of that because they forget. Thank you. That was awesome. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to get more into the discussion once we hear from Dr. Serafin. Um, so I'll jump into introducing Dr. Sally Serafin. Um, she's a Haitian American primate behavioral neuroscientist specializing in the evolutionary developmental neurobiology of stress. She was educated at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, Oxford University in human biology and Emory University in anthropology. Dr. Serafin has worked with a diverse number of species ranging from endangered seabirds, rodents, 
uh, chimpanzees, rhesus, macaques, and humans. This is what really drew us to her. Like she has a really amazing interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary background. So as a true multidisciplinarian, Dr. Serafin has extensive experience teaching anthropology, biology, psychology, and neuroscience courses at small, large public and private institutions. She currently teaches courses in brain and behavior, human motivation and emotion, neuroscience methods, social neuroscience, neuroaesthetics, and also neuro law at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where she will be tenure track assistant professor of neuroscience and direct the laboratory of evolutionary neuroscience beginning in July, 2021. Using an eclectic mix of field and neuroscience research methods, her lab will focus on comparatively modeling the impact of early stress on brain development or behavior through experimental, observational, and longitudinal studies on Drosophila, voles, and primates. As a member of the Culture, Mind, and Brain Research Network, a hope is that this integrative and holistic approach will translate into better social programs targeted at preventing childhood adversity. Her fun fact is that she speaks Danish and also edits a web magazine in her free time. And for more information, I have the link in the chat. But with that, um, I invite Dr. Serafin to share her behind the scenes story with us. Um. Okay, I have to unmute first. And um, I regret to say that I, can you see my presentation screen? Yes. Okay, can you see the, the slide deck or just one slide at a time? I see the slide deck on the side and also the slide. Okay, yeah. how about that? Yes, perfect. Okay, all right. So I regret to say that I don't have a lot of images to share with you, um, but I, I do have what are um, functionally visual prompts to keep my storytelling moving in a forward fashion. Um, so I'm going to start really by telling you the gist of, of what I hope everyone will get from my part of the presentation. And I'm, I'm delighted to see the parallels with Dr. Singleton's, um, you know, approach and sort of interpretation of her development as a neuroscientist and as an individual, as a human being, um, because uh, my um, interest in development is is also kind of a nice parallel, particularly the focus in stress. Um, you kind of study what you know, right? And hopefully in the process of telling you my story, that'll um, be clear. But the gist and what I want folks to take away is this notion that really um, at the end of the day, at the start of the day, always, um, emerging scientists, emerging scholars, people from marginalized um, backgrounds of all kinds need to know their value. I think um, recognizing my value has really helped me stave off um, to the extent that one can things like imposter syndrome that, that kind of tear at your soul and make it difficult to thrive. And then um, also uh, feeling free to choose your own path. And I think this is a theme that, that also um, resonated uh, for me in hearing Dr. Singleton's talk is that she made some very calculated choices along the way that were self-preserving. And um, so, so not only um, uh, choosing a path that preserves yourself, but that helps you to carve out the life that you envision or the life that um, creates the, the best opportunities for well-being uh, for you. So this is, this is the gist of my talk, y'all. These, these six eras um, are really what I'm going to start talking about uh, in terms of my growing up in, in science and specifically in neuroscience, um, which arguably didn't even exist when I was in college. Um, so I was born, those of you who read my uh, official or unofficial bios will know that I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Um, and I, it's important to note that my, my beginning in Haiti um, 
you know, was, was a blessing and a curse, a blessing in that I was born to a very loving family, but a family with certain epigenetics that made us and me today particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of of um, psychogenic and neurogenic stressors. So my my grandmother, um, for instance, experienced severe trauma in childhood. She was, um, you know, brutally raped and uh, um, uh, ended up bearing a child at 16, uh, lived homeless with small children in the streets of Port-au-Prince for many years before pulling herself up by the bootstraps and um, starting a small business, sewing small scraps of fabric to make clothes that she built um, little by little into a, a, a sort of um, uh, well, uh, a small business that employed other women who made clothes and sold them at market. She ended up going to Guadeloupe and eventually to Paris and, um, you know, deciding that she would take her um, sort of hardworking ethic to Boston, Massachusetts, um, where she sort of uh, eventually over time uh, sponsored uh, members from all of her 13 siblings families to come to the US and work. So I was born um, in 73. And not long after I was born, my mother actually left and came to the US to work, um, leaving me with my father and his mother who were very nurturing and loving but you can imagine as as someone who studies the um adverse consequences of early maternal deprivation and separation this was a very trying circumstance for me as an infant um, she came back and forth from haiti uh, to boston over several years um but really i i i attribute a lot of my success to the nurturing and attentive care that I got from my dad and his mother during those formative years from birth to age four and a half when we joined my mother in Boston. And in Boston, what we found um, for me was a, a combination of, of enrichment. So I'm using, I'm using a lot of the language of early maltreatment. So those students of mine who are in the audience will will recognize this from our lab meetings. You know, I, I was uh, afforded the opportunity to go to great schools where I had the support of um, mental health counselors and um, lots of enrichment programs like Big Sister Big Brothers program, um, uh, lots of um, uh, teachers who were uh, really influential and supportive. Um, but at the same time, I experienced a lot of bullying at in the 1980s and early 90s. Um, Haitians weren't that popular. And uh, I, you know, dress differently, I smell differently because of the kinds of things that we cooked at home. Um, I wore my hair differently, often in braids with barrettes and bows, really big bows that are made from like real ribbon, um, often mismatched clothes by virtue of our poverty for probably the first decade we lived in Boston, we either lived in a condemned building through which various relatives and, and migrating friends would rotate upon arrival. And I, as the eldest, um, as the first grandchild and the eldest of my siblings was the family interpreter. My grandmother um, was not educated beyond the second grade, so she never learned to read. And so I, I had this incredible burden growing up of experiencing um, a, a lot of poverty at home, neglect as my parents and my grandmother um, worked literally around the clock. Um, you know, we would have to make our own meals. So from the age of seven, I was making my own meals uh, for me and my younger brothers. And, you know, we would just take care of ourselves until someone came home from work and would unlock the door and we could go to school, um, you know, make our way to the school bus stop often without the appropriate outer clothing for winter weather. Um, or 
um, too much outer clothing for summer weather because we only had one snowsuit to to work, um, you know, to, to as a, an outer um, covering for for throughout the year, the school year. So so lots of poverty. Um, when we weren't in condemned housing, we were in public housing. My mother um, put her way through a pharmacy school once my parents were divorced. And so we had a dual graduation party. When I was, in, when I was graduating from eighth grade, she graduated from pharmacy school at Northeastern University in Boston. And that marked the beginning of our transition um, out of public housing and into apartment after apartment, I think I probably she she was one of these sort of cheap rent hunters. So we probably lived in 20 different addresses by the time I, I got to college. Um, but so so those those years in Cambridge, Massachusetts were really formative because they provided me this this um, well perfect, I guess, cocktail of tolerable stressors, tolerable because of the formatively um, nurturing experiences that I had early on. I, I, I had a lot of grounding um, in my relationship with my dad. Um, and, you know, I, I went to Howard University initially, um, wanting to get as far away from home as possible, but that ended up being too expensive. So I went back home to Boston, um, commuted to UMass Boston, where I studied um, for seven years. Would you believe it? Because I, I just, I enjoyed studying and I like waitressed part time um, and uh, just decided that I was going to spend my life learning. Um, I did all the research that's described in the bio, I won't go into that um, in, in more detail, but it really never occurred to me, despite having been on the science team in high school and actively engaged in science um, growing up through various research projects, I you know, never thought that graduate school was necessarily for me. At some point, I anticipated going to medical school because the, the career options for a Haitian child are um, something in the health professions, preferably a physician or an engineer or a lawyer. That's it. And so I, you know, was pretty certain that I wasn't going to become a lawyer. And um, I thought that I might enjoy being an obstetrician. Um, and but in the meantime, I was just going to take classes until, you know, one day uh, someone communicated to me that I might consider graduate school instead. And that became my path. But I think the, you know, in terms of light bulb experiences or things that stand out to you um, that kind of define you in my undergraduate career. It was this one time when I was in the lab of Dr. Celia Moore um, preparing to do a, a, a surgery on rats as part of a, a developmental study and I got a phone call. And the phone call was from my mom telling me that my brother Claude had been stabbed in the head and it 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 was really you know the the contrast was so stark between what I was doing and what I was in the process of of making of my life and what was really the life and death situation of my younger brother. He was, he's five years younger than me, he's still alive. Um, and so very much, you know, um, I was sort of an allo parent in terms of his care and upbringing and protection. Um, but Claude, um, without that nurturing, attentive, formative experience that I had in those first four and a half years, was born into um, an environment of complete neglect, um, including multiple traumas, um, culminating in his being stabbed in the temple and almost losing an eye. And his path 
um, particularly in the absence of the kinds of enrichment and intervention that I had um, in terms of counseling and supportive teachers um, and encouragement is, is one that has, you know, been really um, overwhelmingly marked by devastation and despair. He currently lives with um, bipolar disorder and PTSD, is a recovering addict, um, an ex-convict. But, but that was kind of the defining moment for me where I realized that I had just barely escaped a fate um, that, that was perhaps predestined and that really where I belonged was in the lab. And so I went to Emory um, and to Oxford, which you can read about lots of trials and tribulations um, there that I'm happy to talk about. But but the thing that that kind of got me through it is realizing that all of that nonsense that you experience, all the drama that that you um, receive as an underrepresented minority in science pales in comparison to the kinds of daily struggles that, for instance, my younger sibling had to endure. And that that sort of emboldened me to push forward and fight through the, the resistance wherever I encountered it. And I met lots of resistance. I can tell you stories, um, both at Oxford and at Emory, um, and certainly in my postdoctoral years at Harvard Medical School, um, where you know, I found it really difficult to thrive, um, if not for fellow postdoctoral um, scholars who were people of color, um, and you know, with whom I formed relationships of of alliance. Um, the thing that I think is is probably the most peculiar about my story. Um, that transcends race and has more to do with um, with um, you know parenting uh, is is that I took ten years off. So I, I told you you know that an important element of my story is choosing your own path, right? And um, after my postdoctoral training, um, I decided that I wanted to do as much as I could to counteract the epigenetics um, that I inherited, if you will, um, by by virtue of this, you know, sort of um, mix of early life experiences interacting on a legacy of trauma in my family. Um, that, that I would stay home and, and focus at least um, on my first child when she came and try as hard as I could to sort of not reinvent the wheel through, um, you know, uh, sort of adverse uh, parenting and um, or harmful parenting is the word I'm looking for. And this you know year turned into several years um two more children came and eventually it was 10 years uh before i went back to teaching full time this is my second year as a full-time faculty member um since i completed my postdoctoral training and i'll be uh, starting a tenure track position in July at uh, Trinity College almost 15 years after I earned my PhD. And that is a really peculiar aspect of my story because there aren't, certainly when I was going through graduate school, I didn't have any good examples of women who had children. Um, all of my mentors either um, had children who were, um, you know, uh, who were either grandparents. So Celia Moore was already a grandparent when I met her, or they were uh, married without children, or they were unwed without children. And so I didn't have this example of exactly when you have a family and how you have a family. And I wasn't sure that I, on my sort of considering my history, 
that I was going to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And I wanted to control as many of the variables as possible. So the choice I made for me was literally to leave. So Dr. Singleton's question about, have you thought about leaving? I thought about leaving when it came time for me to start my family. And um, I, I didn't write or publish for about seven of those years. And that is a decision that I that I might revisit if were I to do it again, um, not merely because I have a very clogged pipeline of publications, but because I think that that is, is maybe a slightly better way to do it. Um, but I'm happy to, to stop and uh, take any questions uh at this point and um i'll be happy to to illustrate uh using specific examples depending on the questions that are posed so i need to stop sharing my screen which is going to be a challenge let's see stop share there we go Great. Um, I want to invite the other SSL folks as well, if they want to get back. I actually got a question from a student who wasn't able to make it. So I think that would be a great question to start with. And uh, both of you all mentioned that a little bit. So I'm just going to read that out. So the question is, do you recommend seeing science as just a job rather than a lifestyle? Do you think it's more productive to think of it as a procured identity that I have the choice to leave? Personally, I think of science as a way to reason and model all of the aspects of my life. It has been great, but at times very taxing. Can you discuss a little bit about pros and cons on either perspective? Yes, so I clearly, um, I am most comfortable thinking about science as a job. Like I am a professor, that is my occupation. Science mentoring and teaching students is my passion. And I love that. It is what gives me life. It's what gives me oxygen. But I think one of the hardest things that I have learned about succeeding in academia is this idea that science will just keep taking things from you if you let it. Um, especially as Dr. Serafin was saying, if you don't know your worth thing, you don't know your value it will just keep taking from you until there is nothing left except for you surrounded by like a bunch of papers or I guess maybe Google Chrome tabs or something. Um, but so for me, the way that I have to balance what I do is by remembering that this is my job, right? Um, I also really advocate therapy to people. And one of the big things that always comes up in therapy um, with me and my therapist is I'm like, do you think accountants do this? Like, do you think accountants are like this pressed about tax season? She's like, no, they're not. Um, I don't really know how she knows that, but I feel comfort hearing that answer. And so for me, it's okay to see your life through the lens of science and to use that reason and objective to make decisions and do things. But in terms of if science is ever going to be as rewarding, if your goals are to have a family, to build a career, to build a chosen family, I think the answer is no. And part of that is that you have to prioritize yourself and your time and your energy and your resources and the things that make you happy. And if that is like publications and stuff, then bet, do it. Um, but for me, that's rest. Like my ancestors, my ancestors dreamed of rest and I dream of it too daily. So I, I'm going to disagree with Dr. Singleton only because what I noticed um, and what surprised me in the time that I took off these 10 years is that my way of seeing the world was fundamentally defined by my um, sort of scientific academic training. So every issue I encountered in my neighborhood, in my children's schools, um, in city politics, 
was somehow shaped by that habit of critical thinking and analysis that I, I, I couldn't disentangle from who I was. And so, you know, every time there was some kind of a beef, I would gather the evidence and I would bring that to bear in our discussion. And it, it was just fundamentally a part of who I am. And my fear with, so, so your job is your job, right? How you pay the bills is just your job. But my fear with, with discouraging people defining themselves as scientists is that it sort of repeats that notion that science isn't for you because of who you are, because you're brown, because you're a girl, because you're queer, because you're short, whatever, right? That, that you somehow, you don't look like Albert Einstein. Um, and so, no, I don't think science is for you. You can't possibly be a scientist, right? You're this emotional, teeming um, individual um, who's completely devoid of rational thought. And so, so, so I, I, I really do feel that what part of our work as people underrepresented in science is, is recognizing that, hey, we are scientists, but our jobs and these people who pay us don't define us, right? And, and, and seeing the separation between the two, I think helps to sort of minimize the toxicity. But I, I find it really difficult to disentangle even, even how I approach parenting. I feel like I'm, I'm really, really calculated um, or calculating, excuse me, uh, about that. Um, you know, all the interventions that are proposed at school in terms of, you know, the sort of pedagogical approaches um, to our for our children. I, I weigh in, not just based on my personal feelings, but I actually look at the data and everything always comes back to the data. And it's really hard to resist that fundamental leaning. I agree with that too. I think for me, I see, I think for me, I see my scientific identity as a passive part of my life in a way that I haven't really grappled with yet. But I definitely understand that, that perspective and that need for, like you said, that critical thinking and using data in that way to inform every decision you make. Um, to piggyback on that question, has that um, changed for you dynamically as you move to, through like different stages of your career or life? Um, has, has what changed? Your, like the way you think about like how entangled your identity is with the science or being a scientist. I, I feel like it's almost like a, a, a badge of courage or, or like a torch that I bear nowadays, especially. So I started this, web magazine that is really about um, interdisciplinary dialogue and public engagement, because I feel like all these people in society contribute tax dollars to support our research and, and we don't spend enough time um, sort of outward facing in terms of our communication. And so I feel more and more like I am this sort of, black woman science robot that's like pushing <laughs> critical reasoning and facts, especially in this age of science denial and misinformation. It's really, I'm finding it really hard to divorce myself, um, you know, or other parts of myself from this prerogative. Mind you, um, Dr. Singleton, I spent the last 10 years resting, <laughs> right? So I'm fired up. No, I, I definitely understand that and I, um when was it it was over Christmas break I took like the longest uh or like winter break um I took like the longest vacation of my life and it was like 20 days of doing nothing and afterwards I was like someone give me any piece of data ask me a question about a single scientific thing please um but so for me I think I think it is stage dependent and it's probably also person dependent right like the way that when I hang out with my friends and my family, I am actively trying not to use my science brain, like my number one goal to be like, no one asked me about a cell. And they sure don't. Um, but I do agree with Dr. Sherpin's idea and 
like passion for this 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 thing that it is my job as a scientist it's a part of my job to communicate science to the public and to be comfortable doing that and to be comfortable having scientific conversations or conversations informed by science with people and i will say it could be because i like kind of just finished graduate school i really am not in a place to do it um i don't in entirely love like the use of like Facebook, for example, with like an aunt I haven't talked to in seven years being like, actually, that's not what that data says, but that it's not what it says. Um, and so that's something that I'm growing to do more and trying to do more. I think when I think about change for marginalized students and underrepresented students, I think about it from an academic perspective, from a top down situation, as opposed to like the broad realm of what it actually is, right? It, it starts before someone enrolls in college. It starts with science outreach and education early on in life from kindergarten all the way up until the end of grad school. Do you want us to um, address the questions in the chat by typing an answer or what are, what are your, I'm just speaking to the panel now. I see some questions yeah. that yeah, so Fernando has a question, so I'm going to invite okay. him or them on stage to, um, so should be on, yes, great. Hello, everyone. Um, my question, is it still in the chat? Okay, yes. Um, both of you kind of like touched on it briefly, um, but I guess if you can give a little bit more insight or information on it, maybe provide an example if you feel comfortable. Um, how have you remained motivated throughout challenging times while pursuing this career? Just because I'm personally finding myself struggling to continue with this neuroscience major, like a, a little bit about me, I dropped it, picked up sociology, but then decided, nah, that's not for me and came back to neuro. So I, I don't know, I guess like, how do you, how do you manage balancing whatever punches life throws at you while still remaining motivated to do the work that is kind of assigned to you and expected of you, if that makes sense. I, I think um, for me, and um, Dr. Singleton can, hi, Fernando. I know Fernando. Um, so giving yourself the space and time to feel all the feelings, right? So when you don't do well or something doesn't work out, like allowing yourself to feel disappointed and sad, and then and 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 you know just crying like laying on the floor if you need to um and then taking a, i think the thing that has always helped me is taking a problem focused approach where i identify okay so what was the source of the failure um some of my failures i attribute to self sabotage right this this um self sort of this this recurring cycle of um of testing the validity essentially of my claims that that I um, you know was a scholar am a scholar right so so what is the source of this failure is it a problem with time management or is somebody actually um, sticking a knife in the situation and and causing you harm undermining you and and then directing my attention outward, not so much um, dwelling on the internal feelings, getting help in the event that you need to talk to somebody, a therapist, for instance, even if you need a psychopharmaceutical crutch to get you through that time. You know, I, for instance, had postpartum depression and um, really needed to have um, uh, some medicine to get me through it and admitting when you need that, that crutch, right? But then looking outward and trying to solve the problem um, in as focused uh, and energized a way as you can. And that that means giving yourself permission to be mad if someone has actually done something to undermine your success. Or at least I think in, in Dr. Singleton's um, biography, she talks about being motivated by spite. <laughs> Like, I think sometimes you've got to be spiteful and show people that you can actually succeed that, um, you know, d despite their their predictions or their inclinations or your self sabotaging tendencies that you're going to do it anyway, right? 
Yeah, I definitely agree with all of that. Um, there was like a Twitter poll a while ago, um, but it was like someone asked, uh, how do you finish a PhD? And a bunch of people were like, out of spite, um, which I don't entirely disagree with. Um, but I do agree with all of those earlier points. For me, um, just with my background and my history with my family, uh, emotions were like not a thing that we talked about and anything really less than excellence was like not accepted. And so anytime I felt any kind of failure or anytime I did actually fail, um, I took it really personally, but I never outwardly showed it. And so for me, having those moments and that time where I do just feel those feelings where I give myself the permission and the space to take up as much energy as I need to cry it out or to just be angry um, is really important. I think it's honestly the most important first step. Um, I would also add that having a community of people that whether they're your friends or your family who can just remind you how great you are and how much potential you do have to do the next thing um, and to pick yourself back up. Um, I also think in what is the most like concrete piece of advice um, is that I always encourage people to just make a playlist of like songs that really hype them up and really get them through tough times. And anytime you have failed a thing or things are just too hard or it's too much, you just put on that playlist and you put your headphones on and you dance it out until you feel like you have the energy to actually work on it. And so I think that multi-step approach that both of us just talked about is really important, right? Because a lot of the times it can look like you're just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and like working way harder. But when in reality, it is a network of choices, of people, of resources to get to that next stop, if that makes sense. My fight song is Bodak Yellow by Cardi B. Good one. <laughs> a good one thank you so much really appreciate it um i will try to think of another question so uh, i'll be here <laughs> um to go to go off of this um so obviously in in science we're definitely going to have to you know do coping mechanisms and mechanisms and things like that but i, I do have to say doesn't it sound kind of sad that uh oh, this is just a fundamental thing that science scientists have to do I mean, is it just a plight of, of science or is there something that we can fundamentally change like in this system that can, you know, make it easier uh, for people to go about their lives? Obviously, again, you, you, you're going to have to have like, you know, difficulties in life that you're going to have to like work through, but constantly, uh, and this is, might be a big question, but I'm going to just throw it out there. Yeah, I think it isn't, it isn't, right? Like, like you said, there is some amount of growth that everyone has to do, like, in their lives or in their careers and in their successes. Um, and so I think like that part about it is normal. I think one of, I think the reason that this is a constant problem in science is like multifaceted. One, it's on the institutional level of like that publish or perish mentality of not incentivizing and rewarding things that give students and people joy and, you know, pride and success in their work. So like not incentivizing um, creating diverse communities or mentorship in any way, shape or form in terms of the tenure process or grant proposals. So that's one element of it. Another element of it is the fact and the idea, which is something that I've had to grapple with a lot recently with my mentees. Um, for whatever reason, you have to make a lot of decisions about your career when you're really, really young and you don't necessarily know yourself or know the things that you need, the things that you need and the things that you want to succeed, right? So the mentoring strategy that I needed when I started graduate school at 21 versus when I ended are very different. And so I think because of that, for me, those are like the two biggest things, that two-pronged problem of not fully knowing yourself to make an informed decision about mentorship, to know what kinds of conversations to have, right? And some of that can come through works and networks that people have built to talk more about like picking a mentor or like building a scientific team and things like that. But some of it also is that top-down institutional change that is how do we reward environments where students thrive? How do we even measure environments where students thrive? And on some level too, what does it actually look like when students thrive? Like, is it going from, is it becoming a PI or is it doing something completely different because you found a really cool thing that you like? Um, 
So I think it, I don't know if that actually answers your questions, but I do think that it is a important part of discussion. So I, I, I have a couple of things to say in response to that question. So I think any person from an underrepresented group um, is, is going to struggle in terms, encounter a lot of difficulty and resistance with knowledge work. So not just science, but social science, um, humanities, anything that doesn't involve a mop and a broom or a spatula, right? But I think it's markedly so for sciences because of the sort of um, hierarchical legacy of the disciplines and science being held up as that most remote and esoteric and difficult of, of them all combined with um, a, a, a historical legacy you know, dating back to neuroanatomists who looked at the skulls of ancient Egyptians and by virtue of their, um, uh, you know, technological advances aligned them with Europeans, with Greeks and Romans more so than, um, you know, continental Africans, right? So, so there's this fundamental bias against um, not only people of color, but women having the brain capacity to do science, right? So it, 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 it's, it's almost like, so there's this, this quote by James Baldwin, I'm not going to get it right, people throw it out all the time, you know, to be, he, he says to be black is to be constantly in a state of rage. I feel like that is um, triplified by being a scientist and being a woman, like I'm constantly mad about something, because someone's always trying to hand me that mop or a broom, when really what I want to do is talk about, you know, neuroplasticity and the importance of investing more in early childhood education and supporting families that are in economic distress, right? So I, I think it's, it's, it's going to happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to find safety in the social sciences or the humanities unless you're going to, um, you know, uh, work with your hands, I feel like, and even then, you know, you're going to be stereotyped, you're, you're always going to meet that resistance, you're always going to meet um, the struggle, because that is what culturally defines the way people relate to one another in America, um, and, and other parts of the world that, you know, are going through these growing pains around um, uh, discrimination and oppression. Yeah, um, yeah, that was just really powerful. And I think a lot of us identify with that experience and just like constantly learning to figure out like how to just, you know, like how to go within modes of like tunnel vision and just like burrow in and just stop focusing on what's going on and then how to like get out of that mode and actually keep up with what's going on. And I sometimes get that when I'm like following news here and then in India and then like I have friends elsewhere who tell me what's going on and it's just, at times you don't know like you know where to where to focus and how to actually like do something about it because you don't want just to be like a passive listener of what's going on uh, but in the interest of time so um, in terms of questions we I would suggest that if y'all can look at the questions and just click on questions answer live that you would like to answer on chat uh, on 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 here and then Mark had a question so I'll let him ask that until then Hello. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, fantastic talks. Um, I had a question specifically for uh, Dr. Serafin. Um, like kind of thinking more big picture, I think this builds off Catherine's question um, a little bit, but like, how do you think, like, like just reading your bio, I thought your training as an anthropologist was super interesting and just kind of, kind of really super unique and especially in the field of neural behavior and um, and everything. And I was thinking a lot about the culture of science and like, what do you think both kind of long-term and immediately we could really do to, to blast open science just as an institution, like less at the individual level and more what long-term changes we can think about. 
So this is an easy question and that I don't have to answer it myself. So um, the Thinking Republic, the web magazine that I edit, that I founded and edit has two. So yesterday we released our our winter 2021 issue. And we have an essay by Dr. Alo Basu at Holy Cross and an essay by um, Dr. Catherine Wilkinson at Arizona State, um, both addressing the issue of what people in STEM can do to help diversify the discipline, um, not only in terms of the, the better um, you know, parity for, for gender wise, but also in terms of supporting students of color, students from underrepresented backgrounds um, and facilitating their successes in STEM. So I'm gonna let you read those two essays and, and you know, those are just the, the start of, of a response. Um, but I think all the above and primarily um, keeping all of us engaged. Don't let anybody scare you away from your purpose. Don't let anybody scare you away or push you out. It's not up to them to decide. And, you know, just as, as just counter the resistance that you feel um, with as much determination and spite, <laughs> I think that might be the takeaway, um, as you possibly can, because you belong here, not merely because you, this is what you want to do, but because there is such a thing as the edge effect, you know, this notion that innovation is facilitated by the meeting of minds, minds from disparate perspectives. And so we have something that's unique and different to bear um, to, to sort of counterbalance the overwhelming emphasis on, on white male um, intellectual contributions. And, and, and by that, that, I mean cis sort of traditional in every sense um, and homogenous. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, that, that was a lot of different answers, including some references, but um, hopefully that helped. No, thank you. And, and Luke just posted the link to that article in the chat. So I'm really excited to take a look at it. Thank you. Great. Um, so we can look through the questions in the um, Q&A. So I'll read the first one. So I'm going to move to that third one so we can like toggle between both of you. Um, so the question is, thank you so much for sharing your time and experiences during grad school after that time where you, where you felt the saddest grad student ever. Um, what were some of the steps you took to move forward from that? And how did you find the light at the end of the tunnel? And I have to say, that's a question that I, I like second, I have definitely gone through some like big steps where I was a week before like crying and talking to my friends on Skype that I just want to like quit science and I don't want to do this exam and I don't care. And then doing a good job and then almost like trying to remind yourself that this this like huge oscillation just happened and how to like think about that. Yeah, so I think I will also say I definitely felt like the saddest graduate student ever multiple times in graduate school. Like I redefine that milestone for myself probably every year. Um, and a part of that, like one therapy really helped me um, being more vocal and like you just mentioned, like talking to my friends was also really helpful. Um, but in terms of like actual physical things that I did, um, I really had to sit down and think about why I was doing science. Like it had gotten to the point where I was like, I really am thinking about quitting this every three months. So do I actually want to be here? Like, is this a thing that I intrinsically want for myself? Will I feel fulfilled and happy? if I get a PhD at the end of this, because there were some days where the answer was just, no, I won't, don't care. Um, and so sitting down and having that conversation with myself was really important to figure out. And I think, I think the way that institutions tried to do this is through getting people to do those like individual development plans. But I think a, a much better way to do it is for you to really think about the parts of science that make you happy, right? The things that make me happy in science are teaching other people how to do science um, and watching someone successfully like run a Western blot like gives me such joy. Um, thinking about the future of science and what I want my institution and my environment to look like. And then also just the sheer act of being able to put headphones on and not be talked to for like six hours a day 
also gives me a lot of joy. And I was like, for these reasons, this career is rewarding to me. Um, I will say, I feel like spite has come up a lot, but a lot of it was spite. And a lot of it also was just my own stubbornness and my inability to let myself quit something because up until this point in my life, I had never quit anything before. And I'm not saying that like quitting something is bad because if science isn't for you and this career isn't something that you want, not something, I think a lot of the times this comes out as one of those things where it's like, well, you can't handle it. Like you can't handle the intensity of science. And that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying, do you need it? Is it a thing that is going to help you fulfill whatever your long-term dreams are? Um, your dreams, your goals. And if getting a PhD doesn't do that, we can do it some other way, right? Like I heavily thought about masters, mastering out um, my fourth year because I didn't see myself as a scientist who could have a lab, um, who could run a lab. It was something I had never met another black woman who was a PI in the entirety of my graduate school experience. And I was like, well, I'm surely not gonna be the first one to figure this out. Um, and so it made it that much scarier for me. And so I, I really had to sit down and think about my goals and what parts of my personality were like trauma responses or coping mechanisms. And if this was really at the end of the day going to be something that I would be proud of not that I like suffered through and earned anyway, but that I would use, that I would be proud of, a story that I could tell my siblings or my Nana, um, that I did this thing not for the awards and the accolades, but I did it for myself, to better myself. And so I don't, I think it takes like some deep level of self-reflection to, to really sit down and, and figure it out. But for me, the things that got me through the darkest days and like the realest of ways was my friends in graduate school, um, also the constant reminders from my friends that aren't in science but are in different facets of academia that just like remind you how great you are all the time. And they're like, you're so smart because you're a neuroscientist. And I'm like, bro, this is glorified biology, but okay, yeah, I am super smart. Um, and sometimes just taking those com compliments and being like, I am great, yeah, I'm gonna be great. Um, so I don't, I don't know how helpful that really is. But for me, it's, it's having to constantly remind myself who I do this for and why I do it. So someone asked um, in the chat whether it was hard to come back um, to science after taking the time off to start my family. And the hardest thing was actually the service um, responsibilities of being an underrepresented person in science all the students of color flocked to me. I remember my first year, um, you know, in 2019, as a full time faculty member at Center College, I had students coming to my office and peering around the corner and saying, we heard you were here. And I was the first black person of any kind um, in the the fifth division, so the sciences division of this um, small elite liberal arts college in Kentucky um, in its 200 years. And so I, I was almost like the unicorn that you go and just look at. And, and I feel like in many places, particularly as students are concerned, and I've had students tell me that I'm the first black faculty member that they've had, um, it, it, it adds a sort of level of, and colleagues, you know, they want you on all the diversity and inclusion and equity committees because you're, you know, you have that special insight. So it means additional labor. And I, I feel like that's the one thing I wasn't prepared for. And that's the one thing that we need to sort of add advocate for accountability and adequate compensation, right? If I'm going to put in all these extra hours, serving on different committees, building resources and infrastructure to support students from underrepresented backgrounds, not just me, but everyone, all of us need to be recognized for that service, that additional service. And I will say that's something I've seen even now in the irony of irony is doing my postdoc at Emory in one of like the blackest cities of America. I'm the only one of, I'm the only black postdoc on my floor I've ever seen. There's apparently another one of us out there. I do not know where they are, but they say that they exist. Um, 
And I think that that's something that is another reason why I stay, right? Like I, my goal is always has been to be the person that I needed when I was younger on every level, whether that is a friend, a mentor, a companion, a mother figure, and to provide that, that sort of looking glass for other black women to see themselves as successful as something that they can be. It's one of the reasons that I teach at Agnes um, to give back to that community that gave me so much. But I definitely agree about the, the compensation and the energy that that takes because it, it's hard because it's, it's something I would never give up. I, I love doing it. It gives me such joy, but it is so much labor. It is so much work. Yeah, those are, and that's something I hear in other, like we had a diversity like meeting the other day where all the departments are talking about like efforts within their own departments. And this question came up about like, just the tax of being a woman or like underrepresented minority and kind of being at the table to give your voice. And we should be thinking about like, you know, utilizing these metrics when we think about tenure, when we think about like the contribution to community. But speaking of that, like as a student organization, we think about this a lot amongst ourselves. And when we have our more like interactive events with other students is like, what can we do as students or like, what can we start doing to kind of start changing these things, like shape the future of research institutions and start like, you know, bringing our voice to the table to kind of support faculty because we, we see a lot of like recruitment efforts that we want to bring diverse faculty and we want to bring diverse students in, but there is often less thought on like, how do we retain and make sure these people are actually welcome? Like, how do we ensure that people feel inclusive? How do we make sure we are changing the culture to like actually feel like make these people feel at home? We don't, we don't want to bring in people just because we want to tell the world we are diverse. We want people and we want to learn from them. And as a international student, I feel that way as well, that I, I want to like, you know, experience the diversity of America that I don't get to when I'm at a research institution. And so I think just broadly speaking, like trying to kind of gauge your views on like student advocacy and activism and what students can start doing as like young scientists to hopefully like start shaping the future. And um, even though Dr. Serafin is like senior, like you said, you, you are like getting back into the field and, um, Dr. Singleton is a postdoc. So we're all like here to, you know, start shaping the future because we no longer want to wait for things to start coming from elsewhere. I think, and, and um, I am sure Dr. Singleton has some uh, comments on this point as well. I feel like students, the voice of students is, is being heard um, much more. So Black in the Ivory, um, at Trinity College, where I'm now, there was a Black at Trin um, Instagram um, account that really sort of awakened the entire campus as, you know, to what it's like to be a minority on campus, a, a racial minority or a gender minority. Um, and um, students banded together and they put out certain demands um, subsequent to the killing of George Floyd. And it took the combination, I think, of, of George Floyd's, um, you know, sacrifice uh, and a, a Black woman president who's a neuroscientist at Trinity College to actually push for um, uh, some ef effective changes in hiring practices. So Trinity is bringing in six new faculty from, um, you know, underrepresented backgrounds this July. So I'm part of a cohort of six called the the New Voices cohort. And so and, and the, the trustees have pledged to increase the faculty um, using special opportunity hiring practices or mechanisms um, by 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 12 more um, faculty from underrepresented backgrounds after our cohort um, comes to campus next year. And I think a lot of that has to do with the students engaged and their demands, you know, after the death of George Floyd saying enough is enough, we want to see ourselves mirrored in the faculty, and we want to feel welcomed on campus, not harassed by campus police, or ostracized by sororities and fraternities that don't, you know, admit us to their parties. Uh, I definitely agree. I think the, I see a lot of, I've, it could be just because of 
the way that the student government is ran within the neuroscience program at Georgetown, but that like bottom up approach to change is really powerful. So the way that graduate students use their voices and I think a part of it is also recognizing that as a graduate student, it may not feel like it, but you do have power, right? You do have a platform that you can use and utilize and like doing these webinars and these kinds of events are really important because they show that these things are a priority um, and to continue to do them and ask for in like concrete steps, right? Like funds to keep them up, to make them bigger, to make them better. So I think it's about on some level structuring the change that you want to see. And I feel like just by the sheer fact of us being here is like a really good indication that you're doing a great job. Um, and I think for me, and it could just be the stage that I am in now in my career, I really, I feel like students do so much. Actually, I feel like they are actually constantly asking for the the change that they want to see, whether that's in terms of the culture, the climate, what the faculty look like, what they don't look like, um, and what they don't always have is support from someone at like the next hierarchical rung step there for them, right? Whether that's postdocs or um, early career scientists, early faculty. And I think that that's changing the way, I think that's changing because people are seeing that these can be priorities if we make them priorities. These can be conversations that we constantly have. One of the things I always encourage other organizations and groups to do is to not forget the intersectionality of all of these identities and what it means to be, you know, an Asian American or a black woman or the entire African diaspora or the experience of queer and trans people and indigenous people in these spaces. It is so easy to do di diversity for diversity's sake, because that is sort of the way that academia was built. And so I think so long as you continue to be intentional about the people you invite, the experience that you have and these webinars and this Zoom, right? The accessibility of this meeting alone is far beyond the accessibility of uh, any meeting I've been at at Emory since I got there, right? And so I think that that shows intention and it shows purpose. And as you move through your careers and you continue to become exceptional scientists or exceptional policy people who like science or people that work in industry, whatever your next step is, remember that behind your voice is a platform that you can use and you should utilize to make the change that you want to see, but you should also be compensated for that, for that use of your voice. Like it matters and it makes a big difference. And I think one of the things that academia is really, that scientific science academia is really good at is making people feel powerless when they in fact have a lot of power. And then in order to compensate for that, making them use so much more time and energy and effort for something and then not compensating them for that. And I don't appreciate that in terms of like students and the advocacy work that students do. So I think that y'all are doing a great job. Um, I think to Dr. Sherpin's point, it's also about thinking about your demands, right? Like, what do you want to see? Write it down on a list and figure out the ways to make that happen. And some of that, unfortunately, in academia is hidden behind a wall of bureaucracy that like even I sometimes don't understand as a postdoc, like how does one really get hired here? Like, what are the rules? I don't know. Um, but once you can start to piece those things apart, you can see where you can make the change, right? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I know we are over time. So um, do you want to take any burning last question or I think I maybe think, we should- I think Kayla has one in the chat. Oh, do I? Or in the q and I'm entering her. Um, but um, while she reads that, let me just say um, that um, I think it's really important for students to not take a sort of, to focus on their strengths and not any, um, you know, so while spike, spike can only get you so far, right? So the, the deficit model approach puts a lot of attention on, on, on that problem and not enough on the strengths and how to propel yourself forward. Um, so resilience, um, your intelligence, 
uh, other personality straight uh, traits, I think, are, are really important to emphasize and not so much the deficits or the past harm, you know, giving yourself a, a space in which to grieve over mistakes and, and maltreatment, but also focusing on your strengths and what you have to give that's positive. Um, oh, and to answer this question in the chat is essentially just elaborating on taking negative feedback. Um, unfortunately, uh, from my childhood, I am pretty good at taking what we could call feedback, but it's just like negative criticism, like criticism that's not constructive. Um, it is easy um, in that same breath for me to internalize that and really like allow that to uh, just ruin my whole my whole time. Um, and so, in that specific situation with my co advisor that feeling of being like caught as the ultimate imposter was incredibly hard. And I, I did not handle it well at the time. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't talk to anybody about it for at least like two or three months. Um, and it, I did allow it to just consume me in a very non-productive way. Um, but eventually I, like, I don't even think I told my therapist about it. Like that's how embarrassed I was. I was like, wow, really just read to filth by this woman. Um, and eventually, I just got so fed up of feeling crappy all of the time. Sorry. I just got so fed up of feeling bad all of the time and walking into lab every day and feeling horrible in a place that used to bring me such joy. And finally, I, I talked to my therapist about it who encouraged me to talk to my friends about it. And then my friends found out and they encouraged me to talk to other faculty members about it because they were like, that actually is not a conversation that should have ever happened. Um, and so I did have to rebuild my, like I removed that person from my mentoring team and then I had to sort of fill in the gaps and like, I don't know why spite keeps coming up, but it did feel like a lot of spite. It felt like me being like, despite these horrible things that this person said, like, I know that I can do this. And it was that moment of them thinking so little of me that like, for me, my DEI perspective makes my science better. It makes me a better person. It makes me more considerate and more compassionate. And so on some level for me, it was being like, that was just a bad insult. Like that was just, how did you do that? <laughs> the, the, the thing that, that strikes me about that incident, um, Dr. Singleton, is that I, you know, obviously I don't know who this person was, but I bet they are the kind of good liberal who really oh, wants you to succeed, but in the process of delivering their criticism infantilizes you, right? Diminishes you as a means by which to build you up. Like how, like that is the sort of, of, uh, uh, you know that we all need to sort of be be mindful and and on the alert um, for is the well-meaning um, uh, deconstruction uh, of who you are. Absolutely, um, they were definitely that person. But yeah, so for me, it was about it was a, a strange moment where I was like, "That's just not true." Um, eventually, it took me a minute to get there. Well, this is like, I, I am feeling a little speechless because it's, it's very rare that we get to have such honest conversations and we are all feeling really, um, I don't know, like really stirred that, you know, it's, it's okay to be honest and maybe we are, we are the lucky generation that we are in a generation where we see our, like, you know, senior scientists starting to speak up and so this is creating a great environment. So I really want to thank all of all of you and especially like Dr. Singleton and Dr. Seraphin for giving us your time, thoughts and just going all out there. And it, it was amazing. And this has raised the bar so high for our next event. So that's great. And yeah, I, um, this is great. And we can all stay on for a minute, maybe after the recording, but um, yeah, thank you again. And if you have any closing thoughts, I will let you do that. Yeah, as I said um, before, feel free to reach out to me via email or like if Twitter's your thing or whatever. Um, I am accessible and I do love chatting with people and like learning more about you and what you want and things like that. Same here. And I feel like the more that we are open about these experiences, we'll sort of build a critical mass. It's like the Me Too equivalent of, of you know, sort of STEM uh, and, and, and I think we'll just raise consciousness about this and prevent its 
constant reoccurrence, right? These stories are all over the place and we internalize them as Dr. Singleton said, when in fact they are just um, horrendous examples of discrimination. That's great. Um, so I'm gonna stop recording um, 